So having talked a bit about how we might define a research infrastructure, I now want to step back a little bit and give you some of the history and some of the sort of the theoretical underpinnings to my understanding and to what I would see as a, a general understanding of what research infrastructure is in the, the modern era. So before we can get to the modern era, though, we have to look at where this whole idea comes from. And it's a, it's a very interesting idea that comes across in this particular ESF report because they actually look at research infrastructure as not something that came up specifically in the sciences. But actually, if you trace it all the way back, if you want to find the beginning of the idea of a research infrastructure or knowledge infrastructure, you're really going back to the Museum and the Library of Alexandria. So you're talking about something that actually is coming from the ownership of the humanities originally. But of course, time has moved on and the needs for research infrastructure have changed very much over the years, in particular in the uh, time after the Second World War when we saw a technologization of research. Um, but there's also, again, a slightly smaller time horizon that is invoked in this idea of the long now of research infrastructure. And so for these writers, it doesn't go all the way back to the Library of Alexandria, but they see it as actually going back about 200 years. And that 200-year time span is based on an understanding that there was two things that caused a need for research infrastructure, one of which is the exponential increase in information gathering activities by the states, so this kind of creation of official archives and statistics at a, at a, at a more massive scale than had been done before, but also the idea that... Um, the, the, the knowledge workers were there and that there was an accompanying development of technologies and organizational practices ab that were able to sift and store all this information so that there really was both the information and the ability to deal with the information. And those two things started about two centuries ago. But if we want to look at what we deal with in Europe as a kind of a modern context for the development of research infrastructures, then we really need to go back about 10 years now to the year 2006, because for me, 2006 was a big turning point. We saw two major publications released in 2006, one in Europe and one in the US. And those mark, I think, the beginning of our current understanding of research infrastructure. So in Europe, we had the publication of the ESFRI roadmap. Now, this roadmap was created at a European level to describe the scientific needs for research infrastructures for the next 10 to 20 years. And I should say that this has been updated and extended in its time horizon. Um, and what the European Commission wanted to do with this ESFRI roadmap, this European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures, is they wanted to say, well, research infrastructures are big, they're important, and they're best used as a shared resource. So to try and um, really bring that together at a, at a pan-European level and to coordinate investment was going to be, bring great value for researchers across Europe. So this was the, the European vision. And there were a number of uh, different entries onto this roadmap in 2006, including what we now know of as the Digital Arts and Humanities Research Infrastructure, or DARIA, and also the Research Infrastructure for Linguistics. Uh, and language resources, which is known as CLARIN. There was another entry on that roadmap at the time, which was a European research observatory in the humanities that was actually never realized, which is an interesting question to discuss afterwards if we so choose. But the other thing that happened, the other publication that appeared in 2006 was um, the, uh, the, the report in the U.S. called Our Cont Cultural Commonwealth. Um, lead author of this was a man named John Unsworth. Now, this was itself a reaction to another report, which is commonly known as the Atkins Report. Now, the Atkins Report was looking at research infrastructure across all the disciplines, across all the sciences, across all the areas, whereas our cultural commonwealth was intended to actually bring out the specific needs of the arts and humanities, of, of the kind of the cultural side of resource, research. So that was something that uh, really kind of took the discourse out of that scientific mode and actually bedded it into what culture need. And what's really interesting about this, I find, is that if you look at some of the things that were actually going on in our cultural commonwealth, you'll see that many of the things that Unsearth was calling for at that time are things that we have yet to actually deliver on, that we have yet to actually achieve, but that we can ever more recognize as important for the delivery of research infrastructure. So he was calling for investment. He was calling for public and institutional policies to foster openness and access. Of course, 
We live in the age when open access and open research data are, are becoming ever more important, both to the funders but also to the scientists themselves, um, to cultivate leadership, uh, to build human capital, I suppose would be another way to say it, um, to encourage digital scholarship. I think that's something that has been happening incrementally, um, but also to establish national centers to support scholarship. Of course, this is something that you could really see those European research infrastructures is doing, and also to create extensive and reusable digital collections. And this is something we're still struggling with. So many of the things that this report, which no matter how old it is, is really still very much um, at, the, at the cusp of what research infrastructure needs to do for the humanities, um, have not been delivered yet. And they still provide us with a very good roadmap pointing forward. But of course, a series of actions doesn't necessarily give us what we need in order to actually be able to deliver. Uh, we also need some, some basic understanding. And I've already mentioned this particular quote, the idea that um, a research infrastructure gets you below the level of the work. Because this is something that, from my point of view, you really need to understand that you're not creating a tool or something that's going to be time limited. It's something that actually is going to have a very broad uh, applicability and that will be very easy for many different kinds of scholars to use in their, um, in their work. Another thing that we need to bear in mind as we're taking this kind of theoretical approach to, well, okay, if we need to deliver on these various actions to create an infrastructure, what else do we need to be wary of? What do we need to be mindful of as we do that? Um, there's also the question, well, what's the role of the digital library in all of this? And that's one thing that we're seeing, and I'll, I'll, I'll be speaking more about the relationship between um, research infrastructures as we know them in the, the European um, kind of research infrastructure context and their relationship to digital libraries, digital archives in one of the later sessions. But the thing to remember is that digital libraries are meant to do the same things that libraries do only for digital objects, whereas research infrastructures take much more of a, of a user-driven, a methodological approach. And whereas these would have had lots of pressure to be drawn together in earlier phases of, of our kind of development as a research culture, now there's much less of that gravity to hold them together. So what's happening is, for example, digital libraries are struggling to a certain extent to maintain what's produced by, by, by scholars. Um, if a scholar produces a website, if a scholar is producing um, EPUBs or anything like that, we're moving from that, um, that, that kind of shells mentality to a racks mentality, to the idea that there's a data side of things. In many institutions, we've seen a, a coming together of the digital library or even the library services and the IT support services. And that is a recognition of this, but it's by no means happening everywhere. Now, we also see that the digital library is struggling to a certain extent to um, enable new methodologies. Um, we're moving from a reading paradigm to potentially a distant reading paradigm and from maybe a history paradigm to a transnational history paradigm. Um, many of the research libraries that I would know and the research archives I would know are incentivized to be a national institution or a regional institution. And the idea that you have users coming in trying to do transnational history, to try to want to bring their collections together with those of other similar organizations, this becomes very difficult for those institutions to necessarily deliver on. Um, they also find it difficult to be open. Again, for some of these same reasons, how are they incentivized to serve users somewhere else in the globe, um, not the taxpayers that might be paying to support the national uh, institutions. And how do they develop the kind of skills and the kind of mentality to understand that their own little silo is actually not going to be the thing that the user might want, that the user may want to bring some of their stuff together with some, some resources from somewhere else and maybe a database created by themselves and something from another place entirely. All of these things in different formats. This is what we call the data soup mentality. So how do we make it so that this data soup can be, can be productive, can be delivered by the, uh, the uh, traditional institutions? And then finally, there's this question of the upfront investment mentality, um, the idea that uh, every object in a collection should be recorded. But as the, 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 the difficulties continue to compound with different kinds of formats um, and an increasing level of things being brought into the digital library, this is more and more of a... Um, of a challenge for them. So um, this brings me just to a, a quick look at a research infrastructure project I know very well. Um, this is the, um, actually the, the, the data architecture of the Sundari infrastructure, so it's the, the Collaborative European Digital Archival Research Infrastructure. 
And I just want to show this to you because I think in some ways the directions where the research infrastructure is moving are quite interesting. And we see this a very similar kind of, um, of uh, architecture being proposed for the European Science Open Cloud, which is going to be a, a major resource for the sharing of research data. But what you notice when you look at this picture is that you have a number of um, ob objects and things at the top, which are the presentation layer. And that presentation layer consists of the kinds of tools and environments where the researchers will use the, 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 the assets or will manipulate them, interrogate them, curate them, do whatever they need to do to create knowledge. And then coming in from the bottom, we have the, the, the various data sources coming in. And in that, that sort of set of, of acronyms, which I'm not going to break down for you because it would take far too long and perhaps not be very interesting, but there is an internal repository for data items. There is a triple store, which has these kind of linked data assets that are used to enhance the data that's there. There is input from a meta search engine developed specifically for medievalists. And then what you have in the middle, and this is the most important thing about this, is that brown line that goes all the way across, and that's the API. So essentially what you have is you have a very large number of data sources coming up from the bottom. You have a very large number of environments and tools you can use to work with those resources coming from the top. And then in the middle, you have just one thin layer that makes it all possible. So it's kind of hourglass shape. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see more and more coming in to the development of research infrastructures as we accept the fact that people are going to want to work with different kinds of data, and they're going to need to to deliver the kind of research they want to do, and they're going to want to use different kind of tools, and they're going to need to to, use, to do the kind of research they want to do. And then in the middle, we need something to make everything talk to each other. And that's really the model I would see for research infrastructure that would be quite different from a digital library. So we'll come back to some of these issues in later sessions, especially the relationship between the infrastructures and the libraries. But we'll, we'll hold here for now.